Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's uh, a good visit so far. It's been a great discussion and uh, yesterday evening this morning. And um, yeah, today I would like to talk to you um, about um, some of our more recent research on contextualized representation and its automatic evaluation. And so overall, um, I'm actually interested in, uh, in attitudes and evaluation. So what people what yeah. people like and what people dislike. The first uh, and that includes obviously the social domain that um, people may have um, I don't know, certain responses to in-group and out-group members, um, like a romantic attraction, like the kind of, uh, or, or is it the people that um, uh, were attracted to. But it actually extends beyond the social domain. Like, uh, consumer behavior, like um, marketers want us to like their products so that we all buy them. Average food preferences can actually go into like um, clinical domain with um, yeah. uh, addictions, uh, phobias, political uh, domain, um, candidate or party preferences, or uh, yeah, already mentioned. I mean, my word, response to that, but um, I have to admit, like, the ABC the general way of setting attitudes and evaluations, um, when we started this research, we actually had all the way to the ABC recommendation. We just ask people what, what they like. published on this paper. And then the problem is, I mean, with using self report measures for um, Location measuring likes and dislikes learning is that there have been numerous context effects demonstrated. Then we started reading up. This is, oh, yeah, this is like a meeting matches. It's one context effect. Like, yeah, what we initially had with the like, house first study that you had your relationship with was actually ABC. Uh, how do we explain yeah, ABC? My point is we expected And then ask you, like, how satisfied are you with your life in general? Um, and I think maybe it is um, possible that you could say, okay, maybe ABC so, renewal is driven. If you give this, higher, higher, if you this question, um, or these two questions in this order, um, what do we have? But it would still correlation between people's answers. What does it mean that something is actually not very high? So which would suggest that something that more important is the association strike. How high maybe you are with the life in general? Doesn't really. Um, uh, the other question that I would still have doesn't really contribute much to their overall satisfaction. But it only has the same question in this case. How satisfied are you with your life? Typically, negative relationships stronger. There is actually usually a much higher correlation, suggesting that relationship satisfaction. We never found any evidence for negativity by the networks or over I think we just like it from one side or the other. And the argument made by Norman Schwartz and Herbert Pless here is that there's a kind of like a conversational norm by all of these studies. Because uh, um, never shown here, you basically get the specific spot. question. Now it's not the general question. Um, if it's something that people sometimes assume, like, I, I already answered the question that, um, about the first relationship, relationship, and when you ask me about negative like, general life satisfaction, if it's something like, oh yeah, like how I'm satisfied I am. So with all um, other aspects, I, mean, I understand your argument that maybe perhaps we don't need 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 or need or need 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 to need or that doesn't have every year when you ask the general question, then obviously you might include. In order to set the factors, you have to find the general question and then um, you just focus on the more specific. I think that's that's the, the idea. So, this is just one example of how like free research is more and captures more editing of people's responses and just assumptions and like ABC uh, renewal is like what the questions are supposed to mean, can influence context effects and even like the, the order of, of questions and kind of survey. And so, then people became very excited. Um, when, like in the mid to late 90s, 1990s, um, social yeah. psychologists yeah. Um, started to develop yeah. measures. I mean, one argument that we have from the first memory literature. So these are performance based tasks. It's actually most often the opposite. Um, which, actually, which we just don't have to ask participants what they like or what they dislike, um, but we infer from their um, more deprivation uh, the speed and accuracy um, to, to responding to stimuli on a computer screen. Um, and I assume that uh, most of you are familiar with it, so uh, the most common implicit association test, other examples of classes of I mean, that would be a task for yeah, the Howard's extrinsic effective sign and task, um, or Keith Payne's effect misattribution procedure. And just to make sure that we're uh, like, all on the same page, um, this is an example of so, an implicit association um, test to, to measure normal references. We're not faced with Pepsi, for example. Oh, so in so this task, participants will be presented with images of um, displaying so Coke or Pepsi and positive and negative words. And part of the participants would be asked um, to, to um, press a left hand key uh, every so time they see a picture. At what point is more information or writing a key when they are uh, presented with a picture of hope? And is there a threshold? And ask to do this as quickly as possible. Um, some information is <laughs> embedded in another block, and therefore um, the agent can text the um, text attention. Yeah. Uh, the key assignment for Coke and Pepsi would be switched. Kind of ambiguous information. Such that um, Coke and the negative would be on the same key. Really have to uh, put a positive on the same key. Kind of like 
And then when you look at the mean uh, response latencies in the two kinds of... of okay, I think there's just a the question. Do they extend that the participants, um, for example, can um, respond um, faster? And with, again, uh, like, uh, is unless all of this was, was just so a cold economic positive and negative, we would assume that they have a more favorable evaluation. Uh, at least in terms of the manners. We never set up a scenario where they perfect. We bought this one thing and then did exactly Another the example is uh, response to the so priming task. So this uh, is based on the idea of sequential priming. Um, um, so participants. But I think are, with your previous information, I think previous information, I think the previous information can then never be a positive or negative word. Incongruent and any participant's task is to indicate as quickly as possible whether the word is positive or negative. From some of our findings, is that we actually find that the biggest information is actually the most facilitated, is simulated when they're primed with a positive image, and when they're primed with a negative image. And the opposite is true for If you have a negative expression with a negative word, so this we can again use yeah, the participants' uh, latency uh, to the positive to some kind of the biggest response. So you actually you're more likely to, like to interpret it in a negative uh, way. Where you have a positive yeah, response, exactly the same behavior may actually. Be and finally, a third task that, that we have used quite else in our more recent research is the affect is a contribution uh, procedure. Uh, that is not based on latencies, but the biggest spatial expression here. Participants are briefly able to control for a bunch of facial features, and then that is briefly or followed by more like flash of a Chinese figure. More likely to be told by an absent eye on the basis black. And participants' task is to focus on the Chinese ideograph. Yeah, yeah, but this just as you'd say, if they find this Chinese ideograph more pleasant or less pleasant, this is actually the degree of, degree of this bias is pretty good. The finding is that the automatic race bias. That's where, where the negative is coming from, the effectiveness of the group. Right. The subjective of these pieces are elicited by this briefly flash. In that sense, I think this here is never being influenced in participants' judgment of the Chinese consistency. One thing that is kind of funny about this task, whatever. Because it seems like counter to the response latency task that I mentioned before. The second question is relatively um, easy to control. Well, I mean, but even if you tell participants exactly how this task works, uh, the effect still don't go. It seems to me as if the um, I mean, unfortunately, the I can't tell you why. I think the is still trying to figure out why, but it actually works. Different focus significantly from the yeah. first part. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing. Okay. So in here, as, um, as an evaluator, people the started using these measures in biological um, research. Um, I think it, I've been somewhat in the sense that it was clearly to find negative or clearly positive. Yeah, but, so um, there are a couple of studies one that have shown that automatic evaluation successfully these measures without really thinking are relatively stable and difficult um, to change. But but they also, were all um, interpersonal that I mentioned. Um, a large body of, of yeah. research showing that they're actually relatively the the person was uh, always like, you know, easy to change. It's sometimes easier to change than. Um, evaluations um, and uh, so you can have um, um, information so that is in, in invalid or other work but who could perceive yeah. the framework of so 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 propositional evaluation or research so we uh, try to explain under which conditions uh, you should get one or the other effects for example um, like um, when you suggest changes people uh, perceive uh, self-reported uh, measures but not implicit measures to be measures inconsistent with competence both. although they have the same but I'm going to talk about today what I'm going to but talk about today like is actually people uh, see this they don't go together it seems like some more people contradiction to the early and the competent people are talking automatic about. evaluations measured by implicit measures so they're actually valid turned out consistent to be highly contested counter to the initial assumption that oh now we finally have by looking at automatic evaluations we can overcome context and then subsequently describe that Showing the same stimulus in like different contexts actually can make a huge difference um, for the evaluator. So I think in that sense, that is a difference and it was always on the same effects that I mentioned initially, uh, so those we can overcome, but it seems like maybe it's something more fundamental okay, that we, um, it has to be incongruent in terms of a kind of prior expectancy, but the expectancy does not have a more fundamental type of context. Like sometimes even if it's so the same some people have um, tried to, to, to come up for uh, explanations, expectations, expectations of someone is competent, but then learn that this person's also uh, more. One model, uh, most prominently uh, represented by Russ, although Fazio, both are positive, argues that so I think that is um, even more like how people, like, like the type of evaluation and, um, that is elicited depends on how uh, people categorize that personal also. characteristics of the people. So, so here the assumption so is that uh, how an object is categorized. Determines what kind of stored summary evaluations are activated in response to the stimulus, and the context may basically influence how a con um, an object is categorized, and therefore. Why are you doing that in your question? Which I was just wondering. Um, Another why you uh, theoretical account, most prominently uh, represented by Norbert Schwartz, um, is radically different from the online construction model. And so here, um, 
So we actually have an argument based on the study. Um, we don't really need to assume any kind of stable representations. Um, any kind of evaluation is constructed on the spot on the basis um, of. But the way I have a momentary accessible app, I think is about it. So, um, Schwartz basically, basically the study entirely rejects the notion of that something like a stable representation of the object. So we don't even need that. <laughs> but the fact that automatic evaluations are so context sensitive, so I just tell you, is actually um, uh, supporting. I think that these, these context cues serve in a very similar way. Our own models. Um, is a bit of a so it's like blend of the two. What we argue that um, uh, the same object may activate different patterns of associations and kind of which more pattern of associations activate it depends like, uh, on the match or even though we have an input stimuli associated structure. So there is a, uh, is a representational component here that we assume associated structure. But yeah, there's also a lot of constructivist uh, components here. It is, um, it's that, that, like, it's not just the input stimulus, but it's basically the entire configuration. And that is why I think the content. And then people may think, like, oh, okay, but there's a bit of a problem with all three accounts, including our and whole. And that is that they can, they're kind of, they're kind of circular. Just think um, to the So at this point, we the, these models which don't need to tell us when um, automatic evaluation Maybe it pays and then the engagement is delivered. Of other basically, things. just assume, oh, if we find a context the effects, effects, then they were different that. to categorize where there was like different like, attributes were accessible, which case, where different patterns were, um, were activated. Um, but we don't really have one of the name means or name priority means other to say when this will happen. Think about the context of which, which same pattern activation, 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 which means like, you may get So this is still a big problem, I would say. No way. So, and for this reason, we started to the multiple things that happen. The learning like mechanisms that um, no, may produce context-dependent uh, and context-independent no reason evaluations. We should we're particularly interested in, in like using um, insights from the and animal learning. And and they're actually, um, we'll get two concepts, um, we'll get uh, two concepts that are very helpful bit, um, for understanding context effects. One concept is called location setting. The other concept is what we do with this really information, how they integrate that information. So location setting, basically describes the modulation of a response that is elicited by a given stimulus. Yeah. Well, and here, the presence versus absence of an occasion setter modulates the response. Target but the, what's important here is that the occasion setter itself does not elicit the response. It simply modulates the response to the Like, when different targets will vary up. So, those are kind of similar to like context effects and automatic evaluation. It's basically the other phases of psychology. So, you have one object, like the same object, you know, with a different evaluation context. And then, but the context itself may be insufficient to produce using uh, the faces that were as context as target, or maybe another concept um, or uh, aspect. Well, of the, uh, I mean, I think the closest renewal, probably renewal the conditions, and um, the the context so become you can <laughs> distinguish between different types of renewal. Never use like one that is where they here. Some case A B A renewal. A B A renewal basically refers to the recurrence of an old response after successfully extinguishing the counter conditioning. Well, listen, um, in, your, in your question, I think, um, in a certain context. And so A B might be um, in different cases way when an animal is conditioned context, to show a certain response, 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 or a repetitive response. This is not a certain context, context A. Right? Subsequently, yeah. the animal uh, undergoes it, it can also measure or counter conditioning um, procedure. Whether in another context B, the co contextual and you have you is evidence for successful extinction or counter conditioning in that context. Same when you put the animal back into the initial context A, with the US. The old response initially has to be like a competition. So that's called ABA, yeah, but there would be one renewal of the CS that is ABA and then um, serves as a CS. And, and then there's another type um, of renewal or it's called is that the context is kind of continuously there. Um, ABA so renewal is an animal refers to the cage. The cage is continuously there. Um, just uh, a particular response here. Context A. Um, but there might be other things. Acquisition or extinction or counter conditioning in another context B. So but then you can put the animal in, a, in an entirely new condition. context that is different from the situation A and in context B and um, the old response. And what they found in this animal And one thing that might already be um, used um, for clear from where they actually acquire um, the same. In that sense, you could argue that in ABA, in ABA it's ABC function, renewal, but context, context C more functions as an occasion set like permanently there. In the sense that the presence versus absence of context B modulates. Like which rule response is elicited um, by the stimulus? Maybe if context B like is present, the newly acquired response is activated. I don't know, like when you have a person like so either um, every time this person wears this 
sure. But if context is set, then context B is absent, like in context A or in context C, then that's basically a perfect core occurrence. It's still the old response. Person and the wearing of the shirt, which might be like the wearing of the shirt itself, just seeing the shirt. So, so these are nice descriptive effects, but we try to figure out like what is actually happening there. So, what are the representations that underlie these these context effects? And here we actually have some very simple basic principles from social cognitive psychology. You say that most context effects are so. The simple assumption that we made was that whether or not. Um, contextual uh, information is integrated into the representation that we're set up um, here. Um, in terms of representation, depends on whether it's people are actually able to achieve that they're potential. I mean, that is almost trivial. I mean, don't pay attention. Very you know, don't include in the representation, but you do have to pay attention. But, um, but it is at least um, the way context has been. But that assumption is actually yeah. does not become yeah. as trivial yeah. anymore if you combine yeah. it um, is with it insights that, um, from research on expectancy like, violation in the sense that. Attention uh, to contextual I think there is truth is statistically low when you like initially acquire information about the effects. effects. So for example, but then when an expectancy is violated, uh, um, that typically enhances attention to the context. Are, so like, um, let's assume you have made a first impression they of a person, um, some data, um, and, and you think that this person is nice, you know, this guy, uh, and then you, at some point, you encounter this person, this person behaves in a really unfriendly manner. That is an expectancy violation. It's like, okay, what is going on? Here? Seeing that so person, that enhances attention to um, to what is there. You try to make sense of the inconsistency. That enhances attention to the contextual information or whatever contextual information is there, leading to an integration of the contextual information. And that basically means that initial experiences um, typically stored in context of A representations, whereas counter-ID two was information is usually stored. the examples you showed, the context was Just to illustrate that visually, to the last point, the way we discussed this study, so imagine for make the positive information of this person that's a spot for the sake of simplicity in a particular context, which you have systematically depicted. Now you, now you tell me that and the way this, this positive information is that you show so components that you think for a particular situation, your um, But then later on, um, if you encounter Bob um, in a different context, um, um, encounter yeah, yeah, negative yeah, experiences, it's more like it's expected there's an expectancy violation. Uh, Attention to context is enhanced, to whatever um, leading to an integration yeah, of the contextual yeah, information yeah, into the representation. Yeah, Leading to a representation yeah, such as like, right, okay, um, perceptual features. Pop in this blue context is actually negative. But um, just because so now imagine features what happens when you encounter Bob in various not contexts. If you encounter Bob in a context that is similar to the initial context, which should be activated is the initial context three representation. The additional response is equivalent to A B A. They may be related semantically. If you encounter Bob in this blue context, in which you made the negative response. What should get activated is the contextualized representation leading to either of any kind of expectancy violation. And if you encounter Bob in a novel context that you haven't seen, uh, in which you haven't seen Bob before, what should get activated is again the initial context free representation leading to a positive response. So this is ABC renewal, this is ABA renewal, and here you can basically, in comparison with the ABA renewal and ABC renewal, um, you can see that the presence or absence of the second context yeah, that modulates which response yeah. is. They also show is that the conceptual effects of their second kind of uh, uh, negative or the initial yeah. for data is effects. Um, and what's kind of nice about this, this conceptualization is, is that it implies some very specific predictions about the stability um, um, versus change of initial uh, impressions or initial um, uh, automatic evaluations and also the context dependency. So for example, if you have an experimental scenario or a real life scenario that um, in, in resembles kind of an ABA setup, you would think, oh, automatic evaluations are actually relatively difficult to change um, because what you measure is the, um, or what it was driving the response is the initially um, acquired um, uh, uh, experience. But if you have a, um, a, um, like a setup, um, that, that resembles an ADB case, you would actually think, oh, actually, um, automatic evaluations are relatively easy to change because what, what you should find is that it's actually the subsequent information um, that's driving the, um, the automatic 
But if you have a, um, a scenario that um, resembles an ABC case, again, what you should, should infer is, oh, automatic evaluations are actually highly stable and relatively difficult to change. And so if you then combine those, um, you can also look at context effects. So for example, if you compare um, cases where you have an ABA or an ABD case, so context A and context B should activate different um, responses. So here your conclusion would be, oh, automatic evaluations are highly context dependent. The same is true when you compare scenarios that involve um, an ABC pattern and an ABD pattern. So context C should activate the initial uh, the acquired response, whereas B should acquire, um, activate the subsequently acquired response, again suggesting that there's context dependence. But if you compare cases um, that involve a pattern of ABA and ABC, in both in context A and in context C, the initially acquired response should get activated, and here your conclusion would be context independence. So with all of these things together, you actually have a very specific um, or very specific predictions about whether automatic evaluations <coughs> should show evidence for stability or change, or and whether they should show evidence for context dependence, context independence. And so in the first study that I want to show you today is basically it's an empirical demonstration of all of these effects in one single study. So the way we did this was um, use the simple impression formation task. Um, we just asked participants or present participants with positive and negative statements about a person named Bob. Um, and we tried to be as subtle as possible with, uh, with our contextual cues. We actually manipulated the background color of the computer screen. So some participants saw this, that information against the yellow background. Some participants saw it against the blue background. And some participants saw positive information and other participants saw negative information. So then we gave them an affect misattribution procedure um, in which we presented Bob either against a blue, yellow, or a white background, and also a couple of unknown people that they haven't seen before against the same backgrounds. Then they continued um, with the impression formation task, and now they, they um, received new information about Bob that was evaluatively inconsistent with the initial information that they saw, and this information was always presented against a differently colored background. And then we basically um, um, had them to complete the same effect misattribution procedure a second time. So this is how it works. I mean, I initially already explained the, um, the effect misattribution procedure in the beginning, so this was the basic setup. And then Bob was presented against the three background colors, like the two of the impression information task and the novel one that they have not seen before. And we also presented a couple of, um, of other faces in that to basically test it. Is, it. is it something about the background themselves that become positive or negative? Um, or is it, is it Bob in that context that um, uh, activates the response? Okay, so here are the results when participants started with positive information and then um, subsequently learned negative information. So what you find here is from time one to time two, there is no change when the responses are measured in the first context. So this is basically the case of ABA renewal. So here we think, okay, even if, you, if people make new experiences with Bob, like new negative experiences, they don't seem to have any effect on that. People still have a positive impression of Bob. But that differs when evaluations are measured in the, in, the, in the second context. So here you see from time one, you see a difference. So here they only have the positive information, but once they got the negative information, that positivity drops. So that's the occasion setting function of context B. But then when you measure in a novel context, Again, what you see here is no change from time one to time two, and that's the equivalence of ABC renewal. And then you basically get a mirror image when participants start with negative information, and so, uh, that is challenged by positive information. Again, no change from time one to time two in the first um, context, but significant change from time one to time two, so it's like then becomes more positive in the second context, but again, no change um, in the novel context. So this is ABA renewal, this is the occasion setting function of context B, and um, this is a ABC renewal. Okay, so this was a kind of a, a like a relatively explicit impression formation task with verbal information. Yes, okay. um, does that also work for like in the animal research we use conditioning procedure, does it also work for conditioning? So um, we recently conducted a study um, um, to do that, it was like um, Katarina Blask in Germany um, uh, conducted this study. So this was an evaluative conditioning task. The participants were presented. I'm not sure if you can actually read that here. So they were presented with like 
different consumer products um, with um, that were paired either with positive images, uh, positive images and negative images. But participants' task was actually not related to those images. They were just presented a dot either on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen, and the task was to concentrate only on the dot, not be distracted by the images, and to press the right hand key when the dot is on the right and the left hand key when the dot is on the left. So they did that um, on like, numerous trials. Um, then in the second block, um, they continued with this task, but now the, the background changed um, and the, um, the, the pairings also changed. So images that were initially associated with positive images were now um, um, associated with, um, with, initially with negative, were now associated with uh, well, positive images, and products that were initially associated with positive were now with negative images. And then we just gave them a, like a speeded evaluation task of these um, um, consumer products, I mean the water bottles of different brands, in uh, the initial yellow context and the subsequent blue context that everything was kind of about, in the novel context that they again have not seen before. And so here at this point we only have a time to measure. Um, so um, what we find is that what matters in the first context is the initial information that they receive. So here when they start with positive and then move on to negative, it, the, the response is still positive, but when they start with negative and move on to positive, the response is still negative, but that flips in the second context, but again, renewal in the novel context. So this is ABA renewal, occasion setting, and the ABC renewal. Okay, um, so one assumption that our model is making is um, that it's all about attention and that the kind of the context is integrated. So we wanted to get a little bit of an um, additional evidence that there's really something about attention to context that's driving these effects. And that we, we, um, we tested with the, um, with the memory study. Um, yeah, okay, so that's, uh, that's what I said. I can move on here. Um, and for this purpose, we, we modified our paradigm slightly. Um, so here now, participants um, just saw a series of positive um, or negative statements about love, and all of them were presented against different background colors. And then after, uh, I think, 20 trials, they received a target item against a particular background um, that was either incongruent or incongruent with all the information that they seen before. So for example, here in this case, participants saw like 20 positive statements and then suddenly there was a negative statement. Um, so yeah, so it's like 20 items. Um, and for other participants, the target item was, was positive. And then afterwards, I mean the participant's task was just um, form an impression of, the, of, of Bob. And then afterwards we gave them a surprise recognition task and they said, um, oh, by the way, can you remember against which background color the statement was presented. Um, that was the, the, the target statement. Now, what we were interested in is, was, is participants' recognition memory for the background context increased when, when it violated an initial expectancy? And um, so when the target item was congruent with the initial expectancy, so this was basically 1 out of 10, so chance response is, um, is 10%. Um, participants had no clue whatsoever about what the background color was. So basically it was like guessing. Um, but if the target item was incongruent, um, recollective memory for the, um, the background or the context increased up to 0.40 um, for the positive, uh, when they had a positive expectancy, and up to 0.30 when they had a negative expectancy. So this is, um, the one thing that I should mention, there's only a significant main effect, there's no interaction here. And we replicated that in another study, um, getting pretty much the same pattern, but again, the interaction is not significant. And so it seems like that there's no difference um, um, depending on whether the initial expectancy is positive or negative. I mean, that's sometimes get asked that question, but at least in this, this research, we don't find any evidence for negativity bias. Okay. Um, so the memory study already gives us a little bit um, insight like about the role of, um, of attention, but um, in, in some regards, attention um, can, can also function in, in a different way in the sense that um, you could ask the question, what happens if people pay attention to context already during the um, um, acquisition of um, uh, initial information? And what happens if you basically reduce people's attention um, to contextual cues when there's an expectancy violation? And so, um, so we've done two studies to test that. So this is basically the initial scenario that um, I, I depicted initially. 
But um, what we're interested in is like if participants or if people pay attention to context already initial encoding, our model would assume that what should happen is that they should form a contextualized representation of, of both pieces of information. So already the initial piece of information should be integrated in a contextualized representation. And, uh, and the same is, is true for the, contextual, uh, the, the subsequent current accumulated information. And that has an interesting implication for ABC renewal because now if you encounter Bob in a novel context, neither of the two representations should have priority. So what should happen is actually that there's some kind of averaging, that probably the two representations get activated to the same extent, um, like, or at least um, assuming that the context, uh, the novel context are um, uh, equally similar or dissimilar uh, to the initial context. So what we would expect is if attention to contextual information is already high during initial encoding, ABC renewal effects should disappear, but that should not be the case for ABA renewal and the occasion setting function of context B. So if you think about that case, like if you encounter Bob um, now in the initial context, what should be activated is the initial uh, contextualized representation, um, activating the positive response leading to ABA renewal. And the same should be the case, or the opposite should be the case um, when, when Bob is encountered in the um, in the novel context, in the, in the second context, which should be activated is the second contextualized representation leading to this occasion setting. So what we expect um, in the nutshell is if attention to contextual information is already high during initial encoding, ABC renewal should disappear, but ABA renewal should remain intact as should the occasion setting function of context B. So the way we tested that was um, before our participants completed the, the primary impression information task about Bob, we gave them um, a couple of statements about some other person named Jim. And they were either positive or negative, randomly to spear from, from tribe to tribe. And they were also presented against different background colors. And uh, in order to increase attention to, to context in uh, contextual information, um, for half of the participants, um, there was a perfect correlation between background color and valence. So here the background color was clearly indicative of um, is, is, is um, this person Jim is a good guy or a bad guy. Whereas in the low context salience condition, the sort of correlation was zero. So like, it didn't really matter, like, um, like in some, some of the uh, backgrounds they, they uh, saw positive and, and negative and the same uh, the other way around. And then we basically had them undergo the same impression formation task of the Bob that I mentioned before. In this study, we actually didn't have a time one measure, um, but they just went through the, um, the effectiveness attribution procedure. Okay, so these are um, the results for the low context salience. Again, the, the pattern is, is um, equivalent to the evaluative conditioning task because this is all time two measure. So, what again, what you see is in the first context, you get um, what dominates is the, the, uh, the information that they learned first. So when they started with positive and then moved, neg uh, moved on to negative, it's positive. But when they start with negative and then moved on to positive, it's still negative. It's ABA renewal. The opposite is the case in the second context, the occasion setting function of, um, of context uh, B. And again, we get um, ABC renewal as long as context salience um, during the initial uh, learning is, uh, is low. But when in the condition where we increased attention to contextual information already in initial encoding, what we see is ABA renewal remains intact as predicted. Occasion setting again remains intact as predicted, but ABC renewal disappears. Okay, now let's think about the opposite case. What happens if we can somehow manage to reduce participants' attention to contextual information um, when, when an expectancy is violated? So, what should happen here then is both the initial information and the subsequent information should be integrated in a single context free representation. So here again, when they encounter Bob in a novel context C, what should get activated is like the, the joint representation like, or both um, information leading to some kind of averaging or renewal. But counter to the, the case that I mentioned earlier, that should also be the case in context A because everything is integrated in a kind of a context free manner and the same is true for um, context B. So basically reducing attention to contextual um, cues um, during the encoding of counter 
or expectancy violating information should eliminate context effects altogether, but should basically produce kind of like a, an averaging of all the information that participants receive. So to test that, um, we again had participants go over the same um, procedures at this time. We had actually a time non measure again because we basically expect that. Um, Context should not matter at all when we actually inhale, or reduce attention during the subsequent. So we need to have some kind of evidence that the measure actually reliably measured something in this condition. So that's why we pulled it the time one measure. Okay. And then we had participants undergo again like um, the, the same impression for me where they get uh, encountered into the information against a different context. And to basically reduce attention to contextual cues, what we did was for half of the participants, they received all the counterintuitive information against the same um, background color, um, but the other half received all the counterintuitive information against a different background color, and the rationale of this manipulation was that um, perceiving or, or basically encountering um, the target person Bob here, um, or making um, um, certain types of counterintuitive experiences in multiple different contexts, basically signals context doesn't really matter. Like in this case. Bob is a nasty guy, regardless of the context. Um, then basically, and through that inference, reducing attention to, to contextual information, or, or contextual cues, and thereby leading to an integration of that information um, in, the context, in the initial context-free representation. Okay, so these are the results at time one. Uh, I mean, this is pretty much, you could say, a manipulation check. When participants receive positive information, they showed a positive response, and then they received negative information, they received, uh, showed a negative. Um, there's nothing unusual about this here. What's more interesting are the time two results. Um, so let's start with um, uh, the single context. Um, like this is basically a conceptual replication of what I showed you before. So what we see here is um, when participants, or, or when, when Bob is presented in the first context, we again find ABA renewal, um, it's a conceptual replication. In the second context, we find location setting, conceptual replication, um, and then the novel context, we again get ABC renewal, conceptual replication. But when we present Bob, uh, or counter any two information about Bob in multiple contexts, what we get is basically an attenuation, um, or kind of an averaging, um, regardless of the context. So context, basic context effects completely disappear. And we get actually a slight tendency for a recency effect in all three conditions. Um, but that was not statistically significant. Okay, um, one issue that I mentioned earlier was that um, occasion setting or is, is um, conceptualized in a sense that the context themselves do not elicit the same evaluative response. But an important question is, is um, in the occasion setting literature, so what happens if the context themselves become associated with positive or negative? Do they, can they retain their occasion setting function? And that's what we tested in another study here. So this is actually, yeah, this is actually a depiction of an associative network model by, by Mark Broughton, where you're trying to, to conceptualize or, or try to come up with a, um, um, a mental representation um, or an associative network of the mental representation of how context may actually modulate the responses to an object. So the, the left one here is for extinction, and that one is, is for counter conditioning. And as you can see here, in at least in outcome to model, the context themselves is actually not really associated with any um, um, evaluation here. So, but the, our question was: Is what happens if the context itself becomes associated with Leon? Can it retain its its modulating function um, um, in, in moderating the response to context uh, to the object, to the target object? So the way we did this was, um, we mo again modified our paradigm a little bit. So now we actually, instead of just presenting information about one person, we actually presented information about two people. So there was like Bob and Jim, and um, one of them was positive and the other one was negative. And all of that information was presented in the same um, context, and we had like four different conditions to completely counterbalance that. Um, and that's important because now, um, counter to the earlier studies, there's an equal number of positive and negative statements um, in that context, so there is no, no um, contingency between context and, and valence as there was in our initial study. Um, then basically, in the second block, that was then switched. I think we saw um, a counter-intuitive information about each of the two targets in, against a different context. 
Then um, we measured their responses um, to, to Bob and Jim um, in a speeded evaluation task um, that included both targets against the blue and the yellow background. And we also presented the, the, the blank streets without any other target, just, just the screens. Uh, or just the, like the blue and the yellow screen. And then afterwards, we had participants undergo an evaluative conditioning procedure where they um, just saw a series of positive and negative images. And for half of the participants, um, they saw negative images in the yellow background and positive in the blue background or the other way around. And that was basically to make the, the, the blue and the, the yellow context itself positive or negative. And then they basically did the same speeded evaluation task again. Okay, so this, um, um, just ask me any, any questions if, if something is unclear, because this is now, um, I think, the, the most complex pattern that I'm, I'm going to present today. So this is basically participants' responses to the backgrounds alone, like no image of any person in there. It's just the backgrounds alone. This is time one. At time one, as a, a reminder, the backgrounds themselves were, were not associated with any melon, so they should be neutral. And this is what we find. I mean, here there's a little bit of an odd effect. I don't know if that was like precognition or something, or, or ESP, that um, they showed a slight tendency <laughs> to like, already anticipate how they will be conditioned afterwards. Um, but I mean, that's not significant. So, um, but anyway, so no, no effect at time one, but after time two, they, they show evidence for an evaluative conditioning effect. So when um, the, the first co context was associated with positive and the second with negative, um, yeah, that is the conditioning manipulation. Then they clearly show the, that the first is positive, the first context is positive, and the second context is negative. But if you get the, basically the opposite conditioning, they show the opposite pattern. And the, the, just the context alone elicits a negative response or a positive response. So basically, a manipulation check, our conditioning manipulation worked. And it worked actually so well that they even anticipated that even before they went to. But um, anyway, so I, I don't get too much on that effect. Um, OK, so these are just the backgrounds alone. The next question that we have is, um, or it actually wasn't really a question, it was actually an interesting finding. Um, when we look at the targets in the context, depending on how the contexts were conditioned, we actually find the same. So it seems like, um, like for example, when, the, when we condition the yellow context to be positive, and then presenting the yellow context with a person, that still elicits a positive response. So this is basically, I mean, the, the pattern is pretty much equivalent here. So this is, like these two figures are just the, the context alone. What evaluative responses are elicited by the context? But the more important question is now what happens to occasion setting? Um, so this is, this is now a different depiction here. So now here these different bars refer to whether the information about the target was initially positive and then negative, or initially positive and then uh, initially negative and then positive. So let's start here at time one. And here, this is basically when they already had the, um, the evaluative information about the target people. So when participants first learn positive information about a target and the negative information about the target, at time one, when they only had the positive, that leads to a positive evaluative response. But when they only had the negative information, that leads to a negative evaluative response. Um, when, uh, sorry, this was all after the the entire, like the two block impression formation, but um, before the conditioning, that, that I should remember. Time, uh, recall. Like time one at this point refers to post impression formation, but pre conditioning. Um, okay, and so basically we get the opposite pattern when they, they start with negative and then move on to positive. So that's like basically they, they activate the information that they learned about the two people in each of the two contexts. So that is basically like a successful um, impression formation. And then the next question is that at time two, once we condition the context themselves to be positive or negative, does this pattern remain intact? And, and it does. So basically what this tells us is a context can actually acquire two different functions. On the one hand, it can modulate the evaluative response that is elicited to a target object. But independent of that, 
the context can actually directly activate a positive or negative response. So the two things can actually happen at the same time. So it's not only that the, the valence of the, the context itself um, um, leaves um, the, the occasion setting or its occasion setting function unaffected, it actually can basically produce a dual effect. It's a kind of like a direct effect and a moderating effect. Okay, um, so one question that you could ask is, um, like in all of our studies that we've done before, um, or that I've shown you so far, there was a change in, in the context. Um, so this could suggest that people may actually try to make sense of the expectancy violation by searching for a causal attribution. So they think like, okay, what is different here? Like, okay, the different context is different, and that explains why Bob is such, uh, suddenly such a jerk, although he was such a nice guy before. But there is an interesting effect in the animal learning literature called AAE renewal, suggesting that um, um, that may actually not be uh, necessary. Um, that we basically get the same kind of modulation, um, even if there is no contingency between valence and context. Um, so here, that's basically AAB renewal refers to the effect when um, there's initial learning in the initial context A, extinction or counter conditioning in this case in a, in a novel context, in the same context A, but then renewal in, um, in a novel context B. So if applied to our case here, like you could still argue Okay, people may form a context-independent representation of the initial experience. Then attention to contextual cues is enhanced when they make a counter attitudinal experience, leading to a contextualized representation here. But then when um, Bob, in this case, is encountered in a, in a novel context B, what should get activated is initial context-free representation. But as I mentioned here, there's presumably no causal attribution involved here. It's, it's just like enhanced attention to the context should be sufficient, but the yellow context doesn't really explain why Bob is suddenly different. And so in this study, we, we tested AAD renewal also for um, in, in our paradigm. And what we also tested is what, what happens if we enhance attention to contextual cues um, um, in, in the case of AAD renewal. And what we should have here is uh, um, uh, uh, attention to contextual information is already enhanced during the initial learning. All of that information should get um, um, integrated in a single contextualized representation, leading to averaging in uh, in the novel context. Basically, also like similar to or conceptually similar to the earlier case, leading to an attenuation of, of AAB renewal when, when attention to context is enhanced during initial learning. Okay, so <coughs> the way we did that was um, so we used the same context priming paradigm that we've used in our earlier study. Um, then had participants complete this impression formation task, the same structure as we used before. But this time, they basically, um, in the second block, um, when they saw the counter attitude information, there was no change in the, in the background colors. It was exactly the same. Um, and then we uh, had them complete the same effect distribution procedure again. OK, so um, let's first look at um, what happens when um, context salience is, is low. So when we um, present Bob in the initial learning context, what matters is the most recent information. Um, so when they started with positive and then moved on to negative, um, they show a negative response. But when they started with negative and then moved on to positive, they show a positive response. So this is basically the, the activation of the contextualized representation, the most, most recent representation. When context salience during the uh, initial learning is high, there's no attenuation. That is basically the same uh, or conceptually equivalent that enhanced attention to contextual information does not um, attenuate a, um, ABA renewal. Same, same pattern. In the novel context, when context salience is low, we find evidence for AAB renewal in the sense that the initial response comes back, although in that context, it was actually um, suggesting that the, no, uh, the new response has been going. So when they started with positive and then moved on to negative, they still showed the positive response. But when they started with negative and moved on to negative, positive, they actually still showed a negative response. So that's the AAB 
And, um, but when we enhance um, attention to contextual information already during initial learning, a B renewal disappears. Okay, um, now the um, multi-million dollar question. What is it actually a context? I mean, in our studies, we kind of simplified our job and we just used the background color of the computer screen and that was like very helpful to like get all the nitty gritty details here. But um, if we want to understand context effects in real life, um, we need to do a little more than that. And like, for example, here, like in this like, um, classroom context, what is it that this is, um, that is relevant here in this context. Is it like is it a classroom? Can like a different classroom be a, a f doing the same functional job, or um, like the conceptual equivalents here? Or is it that any room that somehow resembles this room perceptually um, could do the same job, even if it is not a classroom? So these are some very difficult questions, and so we try to get a first grasp of it, and uh, so. I think we have some interesting findings, and still not um, like um, I think we still need to do more. So a little bit of a caveat, um, um, but but I think we there there's something here. Um, so the way we tested that, we actually moved on to to real life context, and so in this task we um, again had two target individuals, um, one being described as positive and one being described as negative, and we presented them against a, a real life context, um, like in this case like the. Um, the initial, the initial learning always happened against this like open clouds. Um, and then when they um, are represented with the subsequent or the counterintuitive information, the context changed. Um, and then we, we measured uh, with an effect misattribution procedure participants responses in the first context that they already knew, the second context that they already knew, a context that was perceptually similar to the second context, but conceptually distinct, conceptually similar to the second context, but perceptually distinct, or completely distinct. Okay, so just to give you a sense of our material. So what, these are the, the background images that we use for, um, for the second context. So as you can see here, like these were four images that were mapped for like conceptual versus perceptual similarity. So those two images, although conceptually distinct in the sense that one shows a tree and the other shows a, a windmill. They were perceptually similar in the sense that like, they were similar color, a similar um, structure of the background and so on. Same down here, that you see a row of windmills and a kind of row of trees, conceptually distinct but perceptually very similar. Those two are conceptually similar in the sense that both show a windmill against an open sky, but they're perceptually distinct. Same here, they are conceptually Similar in the sense both show a tree like or with branches um, against an open sky, but they're perceptually distinct. And then you basically, when you compare those two, those are both conceptually and perceptually distinct, and those two are also both perceptually and conceptually distinct. And so we kind of completely counterbalanced um, like um, the array by like, using using those images. Okay, so what is what we found um, when we present? Uh, the target people in the or target individuals in the first context, we basically get um, the same AAB renew ABA renewal um, that we got before. Um, so when they started with positive and then moved on to negative, they still showed the positive response. When they started with negative, they then moved on to, to positive, they still showed the um, the negative response. So this is AB area. Second context, basically they, they showed the recency effect, that is the occasion setting function of the, the signal. But now the question is, is, which other contexts produce the same location setting functions, although they are not the same as the second context, but they share, share either do or do not share certain features with the second context. Contexts that were perceptually similar to the second context also produced a significant um, recency effect, suggesting perceptual similarity matters. So, um, but for the context that were, was conceptually similar but perceptually distinct, and for the concept that was, uh, or context that was entirely distinct, there is no recency effect. So th these, these effects are not significantly different from each other. So one question that you might ask, and this is where I basically see like the, a bit of the, the problem here is, for the distinct context, 
because that was entirely new. It didn't have any resemblance to the second context. Shouldn't we get ABC reading? And the point is, we did. Um, and I think that is a bit of a problem with, with our paradigm, because we presented participants um, with the positive and negative information that they first saw already against a background. That is pretty unusual. Like, my participants probably would ask, like, okay, why is this person presented against this awkward sky with this background? It's probably important, so I better pay attention to it. And if you remember in this one study where we primed participants to pay attention to, to the context already during initial learning, what happened is ABC renewal had disappeared. So that's why I think we were not able to, to replicate ABC renewal here, because um, just by merely by presenting a target person during initial learning against the background already suggested, oh, you better pay attention to that because um, if that was not important, the experimenter probably wouldn't show me that weird, um, weird sky. And um, so that is my kind of postdoc explanation, but I think we, we still need to do quite a bit of research to get a better grasp on that. Um, um, but I think we have at least prim preliminary evidence. Perceptual similarity does matter, and um, at least conceptually, um, there are um, a correlates in the animal learning literature um, where they actually sometimes even just dim the light to change the context, and that already produces the same effects. And so there's still the animals are still in the same cage, um, but just changing the light conditions can can make a difference. And that's obviously perceptual, not conceptual. Okay, so to summarize. Um, so, the question that I started with was, um, was how can we like, understand these patterns of context dependence and um, maybe even like, also include like, the question of stability versus malleability. And I argued that the concept, uh, concepts of renewal in the vacation setting would actually be very helpful to understand that and actually even give us some a priori predictions that we can test instead of just providing post hoc explanations um, in terms of the, uh, the early accounts that have been done. And so we actually can get very specific predictions about stability and change and very specific predictions about context dependence. Um, um, and we also, um, like in addition to those, we, we already have, have learned a lot about like the contextualized representation of alignment and, and, um, and the learning mechanisms. So with regard to the learning mechanisms, we, we found that um, um, it doesn't matter if there's propositional learning of verbal information or associative learning of co-occurrences, we get basically the same effects. Um, we learned that attention to context is a, is a critical variable, so it's with, um, consistent with our model when we enhance attention to, um, to the first context that reduces an ABC renewal but not ABE renewal. If we can uh, manage to reduce attention to context during um, uh, to the sub second context, that eliminates context effects altogether, again consistent with, uh, with our model. Um, when the context themselves acquire valence, um, that leaves um, uh, oh no, yeah, all these context effects that we found were unqualified by um, subsequently um, learned uh, learning of context valence. And so we can basically um, a context can have simultaneous effects in the sense, or, or, or two, two distinct effects in the, in the sense that they can actually directly activate an evaluative response. But independent of that, they can also moderate, um, or still moderate, the evaluative response that is, a, um, is activated by target object in that context, independent of the con uh, evaluative response that is activated by the context itself. Um, I talked about the difference between attention and attribution. I think like, pretty much most of the studies are consistent with an attributional account, where people just try to, to identify a causal explanation for the expectancy violation. But as I argued, um, Although causal attribution may contribute to these effects, they're actually not necessary. Um, and that is um, suggested by the case of AAB renewal, where there's no, no contingency between context and valence. And finally, um, in the last study, I argued that um, perceptual similarity is, is sufficient to produce these kinds of, kind of context effects, whereas um, conceptual similarity, at least with our um, initial findings, suggests that it's actually um, insufficient. And that's where I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to take any questions.